Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, a Labor Day special. We'll discuss the changing nature of employment in an increasingly digital world, hear how an executive order from President Obama might impact LGBT employees in Arizona, and we'll get a legal analysis of a major ruling that gives college athletes the right to unionize. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to this special Labor Day edition of Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. We begin tonight's show by looking at the changing nature of employment in a world where machines and computers are increasingly replacing human labor. Dennis Hoffman is an economist with ASU's W.P. Carey School of Business. Then it's always a pleasure. Um, we're looking at this, this continuing series is looking at the future of things in right. Arizona in general as well. This is fascinating because the future of jobs, I mean, we could be redefining what a job is. Absolutely, Ted. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, you can read these look into the future books and robotics and and the age of the machine and all of this kind of stuff. And it sounds a bit science fiction oriented, but I, th I think this really resonates with a lot of folks right now. Folks that have experienced job loss due to automation and have not been able to say win this race with the machine that uh, these people talk about. In the future, do you want to race with the machine or do you want to run alongside the machine? I think you want to race with the machine, alongside the machine as, as you've said it. Not, not with the thought that you can beat the computer um, not with the thought that you can take advantage of automation or prevent it from happening or technological process or somehow hold this back or impede it. Uh, I think we need to embrace it. And I think those that do choose to embrace it, and you can do so in many ways. We're, we're talking about STEM degrees, obviously, but we're also talking about people that can articulate products that machines can produce, that can market services that these machines can create. And, and that, you need to complement this automated process. And those will be the winners. Those that turn their backs on this, that you know, say, well, the, you know, the, the economy just didn't provide for me, um, that, that's gonna be a, a, a tough row. Is there a worry, though, a concern that technology could be outpacing the training that we're all scrambling to get? <laughs> well, absolutely. Um, I think, I think it's tough to train, you know, keep pace with training um, uh, th that keeps pace with automation. My mind goes back to a statistics professor that I had in college, and he said, I will teach you classical statistics, I will teach you applications that will last your lifetime, but I will not teach you what happens when you punch the F4 key on a computer. I will not do that because what happens today will be different than what happens tomorrow. And, if, and of course, we need applications, we need to understand applications, but we don't need to get wedded to current technologies. We need to be adaptive and uh, you know, be able to keep pace with this ever advancing technological process. So what does that mean in terms of jobs, in terms of employment, part-time jobs becoming more prevalent, do you think? It means that individuals that continually monitor their skill set. So as, and I don't want that to be, that doesn't always have, mean that you can always fix the latest computer. That means you always understand what computers can deliver. And you could be a market, you could be in marketing, you could be in sales, you could be in distribution, you could be in supply chain. You, you need to understand how goods and services will be transacted as a result of this new machine age and skills in the past that were rewarded say physical skills and strength and brawn and um, they're going to be replaced i think the rewarded skills are going to be people that are conscientious people that can communicate uh, actually it cuts across genders uh, these authors write that women may have the distinct advantage going forward ted because women are more conscientious uh, they're they're able to interact with people at 
dimensions that uh, outstrip men's ability in many cases. So from a public policy standpoint, how do you keep from having a society of a bunch of stubborn dudes who aren't keeping up <laughs> and they're not employed? I yes. mean, you know what happens yes. when, when societies have a bunch of folks that aren't employed and folks who think that uh, the disparity of income, it sounds like this is a recipe for even more inequality of income. What's going to happen it in is, the future? It is, that is a potential, that's a risk. That's absolutely a risk. Now, the market signals will be clear to those individuals. They're going to have to embrace some of this. Now, there always are going to, is going to be room, say in an Arizona for uh, HVAC technicians, for people that are going to, you know, need a modicum of technical skills, but are willing to kind of roll up the sleeves and, and, and do some work. Uh, so there will be jobs there, but the jobs that will be rewarded by the market are those jobs that embrace this technology. So that's what these authors talk about, the big divide. So if you're, if you're content with manual labor, if you're content uh, with not embracing what a machine can do, uh, your lot is going to be low income and in a, in a pretty tough job. In general, does that mean that we look at uh, prosperity in a different way? And again, I go back to this part-time nature. Machines make things more efficient. There's Absolutely. no doubt. If I'm working eight hours or 10 hours a day and all of a sudden a machine's doing what I'm doing in three or four, what am I doing the rest of the day? Well, leisure, uh, we're gonna have more leisure time. We're, we're gonna have goods. Um, you know, some of the points that have been made in this literature suggests that we don't even measure GDP correctly because GDP is very price-based. If things are given away for free on the internet, which there's huge amounts of information for free on the internet. I bought a car today. I did all of my research on the internet and I learned a lot and it was very helpful in the negotiation. I got all of that information for free. My goodness. Okay, so again, public policy, Arizona lawmakers, decision makers, what did they see when they look into the future and all you see is a bunch of digitals, dots and dashes here? What did they see as far as policy is concerned? Well, policy, there's, there's still a role for government. Uh, gov government, uh, you know, some of the folks out there watching and they're saying, Ted, well, it's Hoffman and he's on horizon. He's always found a role for government. Uh, but in this case, the role for government is to provide uh, for education, provide for opportunities for people to learn these skills. And again, STEM is one set of skills, but it's not just STEM, it's ability to communicate, it's ability to, to kind of think analytically, align yourself with the abilities that these machines have, and think about how you can market products and services more efficiently and more in a more lucrative fashion. Infrastructure is, is certainly a government play. Tax reform would be a government play. Immigration reform, and we've talked about this ad nauseum, but it is, it is huge. Uh, immigration reform would help unleash uh, this labor force. About 30 seconds left. Is Arizona ready for this future? Oh, we hope so, Ted. We absolutely hope so. Now, there are some in Arizona that you know, are waiting for the old Arizona to come back. Well, well, let's just wait this thing out and we'll become this, uh, you know, this growth magnet, this people magnet, and construction will take over again. Uh, I think as every month goes by, people are really starting to question that. So investing in education, you know, and, uh, and, and more investments in higher education, uh, voca vocational skills, they're, they're needed, they'll be rewarded. It's absolutely fascinating stuff. Uh, brave new world out there. Good to have Indeed. you here. Thanks for joining Great us. Great to be here, Ted. President Obama recently issued an executive order that bars discrimination against LGBT employees working for federal contractors and the federal government. We spoke with Phoenix labor law attorney Jeff Brodeen about the order's impact on workers and businesses here in Arizona. Good to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, what exactly did the president do? Really two big things uh, yesterday. One was to amend Executive Order 11246, which prior to yesterday prohibited discrimination by federal contractors, um, employees of federal contractors, on the basis of race, gender, religion, national origin, and sex. And he, to those categories, um, the president added now with this stroke the pen yesterday, sexual orientation and gender identity. So this protects 
federal or employees of federal contractors, which is about 25% of the workforce. And this was originally, you mentioned uh, racial, along racial lines and, and sexual lines. This was uh, LBJ back in that day, correct? Correct. It's 49 years old, yes. the, the executive order. So pretty close to the same age as the Civil Rights Act, which he signed the year before. And another one not too far uh, along was, I think, President Nixon signed something regarding federal employees. That was amended as well? Correct. That's 11478. Um, and that was signed by President Nixon, I believe in 69, to prohibit federal government from discriminating against its employees. So federal employees gained the same protections as under the order that was signed by President Johnson. That was amended in 98 by President Clinton to add sexual orientation. And so what President Obama did yesterday is he added gender identity to the federal employee protections. And Okay, so what about religious groups, especially with these federal contractors? How does that apply? There is no carve-out, as there um, has been proposed in some of the federal legislation. But in, under the Bush, second Bush administration, there was, a, there was a religious clause that allows an employer that is a religious institution or association to favor a person based upon their religion. So say it's a Catholic church and they're looking to hire someone in their school, that they can favor someone who's Catholic, but they can't exclude someone on the basis of the protected categories. Okay, so, so that wasn't necessarily amended. That still is in play, but that's, that is changed a bit by these amendments, correct? Correct. I mean, that it actually might become more important to some religious institutions because of the fact that it's a category that some churches view differently, it's sexual orientation or gender identity, than the other protected categories. And it was a topic that was lobbied, President Obama was lobbied about prior to his signing. And there were a number of religious groups in favor of not having an exclusion, keeping it as it was. And there were other religious groups that argued for a total carve out and exception. So before yesterday, was being gay a firing offense for federal employees and or federal contractors. Yes. It was. I think that would surprise a lot of people. It, when they do surveys on what, how many employees are protected on the basis of sexual orientation in particular, most people think it's already law that you can't discriminate against someone on the basis of sexual orientation. However, there only, it, that protection exists only in 18 states and a number of municipalities like Phoenix mm -hmm. and Tucson and Tempe, there's a, a ballot initiative coming up in August to see if the action of the city council there will be affirmed. And you mentioned previously that there was federal legislation that was supposed to uh, address this. Obviously, that has not happened. What was going on with that? Sure, um, the, the law is called ENDA, and I'm not even sure what the acronym stands for, but there's been some form of that in Congress proposed and considered over the last 40 years. It's come the closest in this session when the Senate in November passed with the bipartisan majority, passed ENDA, um, but it's stalled in the House. It, prop it looks like it would have a majority um, and pass if it came to a vote, but Speaker Boehner's made it quite clear he's not going to bring it to a vote. And the fact that he's not doing that, thus the president says executive Correct. order and the president can do this? Correct. This okay. is an executive order. That's the type of thing only the president right. has the authority to do. It's federal employees. It's, the, it's exactly the nature of the, uh, the type of action the exec chief executive has the authority to do. Okay. Where does Title VII play into this, if it plays into this at all? First of all, describe Title VII. Title VII is the first name was the Civil Rights Act of 1964, also then became known as Title VII by the number of the, of the act. And that prohibits discrimination by an employer on the basis of the same categories and, and more um, disabilities under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Some um, genetic information now is pulled under. But what Title VII does, it prohibits discrimination, but it also gives employees a remedy so that if they've been discriminated against or believe they have, they can go to the EEOC, file a claim, say, I was discriminated against. They can get damages. Um, the EEOC can ask for reinstatement. There's, it's really the statute that allows the employee to get redress if they've been discriminated against. And again, what the president did was to the employer say, you can't do X, Y, and Z. What Title VII would do would be to the employee, if they do X, Y, and Z, here's your remedy. Correct. Is that, is that pretty much Correct. it? Correct. And the, what's the, the development, the new development in that area is that sexual orientation and gender identity are not specifically protected characteristics or categories under Title VII. 
But what the EEOC has currently takes a position is that Title VII does include protections against sexual orientation, discrimination, and gender identity under the prohibition of sex discrimination of Title VII. So as far as the EEOC is concerned, it's already there. Yeah. And there is a district court case that has ruled the same way. So like same-sex marriage developed through the courts, I think this is an area that's going to follow that and that the courts are likely to rule in the, the, with the position of the EOC. That's a prediction at that point, but it looks like it's a, it's a possible one. Uh, aside from the critics who, who you look at this as yet another example, uh, they see it as the president's imperial presidency and, and, and those kinds of criticisms. There's also concern that it opens employers up to the threats of costly legal action. Uh, valid concerns? What do you think? Every time a category has been added to protections against discrimination, that's the argument traditionally that businesses have, been, have made. This area, protection based on sexual orientation or gender identity, it, it's really been a sea change in the position businesses take. Businesses on the whole favor this protection. They believe it's good business to have these protections in their policies, to, to have you know, programs that really promote diversity, and this is an aspect of diversity. And, and I think in this day and age and economy and workplace, employers have really come to learn the value of diversity. So most employers do have policies that protect based on such sexual orientation and gender identity. However, there are many who don't, and it's for those employees who may be working for one of those employers that they need the protection. Last question, impact of the executive orders on Arizona. Well, Arizona, while 25% of the workforce work for federal contractors, Arizona is a state where we have a lot of federal contracts through the various big businesses we have in town. So that I've not seen statistics on it, but my guess is it would be even larger than 25% of the workforce is now protected under the executive order. All right. Jeff, good to have you here. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. We wrap up our Labor Day special with a look at a ruling that gives some college athletes the right to unionize. A regional director of the National Labor Relations Board recently ruled that college athletes at Northwestern University are employees and thus have the right to unionize. We talked about the ruling with Phoenix Labor Attorney Stanley Lubin. It's good to have you here. Uh, this, My pleasure. Well, this is, this is a really big deal and in the future it could be a really big deal. What's going on here? Well, it, it could be a big deal, but when you count the numbers today, it really isn't because it applies only to private schools and uh, anything that is not a public school, a publicly owned school because they're exempt from the statute. So this, out of the, all the major colleges in the country, 17 of them are covered by this decision. Some of those 17 schools, obviously Northwestern, Stanford, Notre Dame, USC, those are big college sports Miami. schools. Miami. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's true. And then the Loyola schools. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so what did the National Labor Relations Board, and this was not the full board now in right. D.C., this was the, the, the... Just the regional director in Chicago. In Chicago. What, what did exactly did they rule? He basically said these football players are athletes, are employed by the university. They're basically, they're not paid in cash, but they're paid. They get scholarships, they get room and board, they get clothing, uh, they get travel, they get food. And in return for that, their lives are controlled by the university's athletic department. They, they are told when to eat, what to eat, where to eat, uh, how, to, how to dress. Uh, they, they are required to be at practices, sometimes up to 40 to 60 hours a week. And even during the school year, their football takes priority over their academics on occasion. So it, it's, it's a very big thing for them to, to decide whether or not, what, what is their life gonna be like, and it's that of an employee. An employee is not necessarily just paid in cash. It's if you work for somebody and you get remuneration for it, it does not have to be in cash, you're an employee. Compensation for service, right? Compensation for service. Schools are saying, and the NCAA is saying, that the scholarships, they're not, that's not compensation, that's a grant. They can call it whatever they want, but it's compensation when you require the students, the athletes, to be present for half their summer. Then when they're in school, they're working 20 to 40 hours a week, sometimes more, to the point where, for example, in the record at the Northwestern case, 
There is evidence that, for example, if a student wasn't available at the time a test was given, they would ask the professor to move the date of the test, and most of them would. Uh, they, they, in addition, they would actually hold the bus back for students so that they can take a test if the professor wouldn't get yield on it. This is no question about it that these kids are being paid. And again, compensation for service, also uh, they're under the direct control, you say, of the school, but really of managers, and those managers happen to be their coaches. That's correct. They have to get permission to leave campus, for example, if they wanted to go home for a weekend or something, even during the non-season. A good example of what happens is that the players have to be where the coaches want them to be, when they want them there, and doing what the coaches say. That's what an employer does when you're at work. You're being managed. You're being managed. You're totally controlled by them when you're at work. So other college players, again, at private universities, this could be an issue. Not public universities because the National Labor Relations Board does not have authority over public universities? That's correct. The definition of employee under the National Labor Relations Act excludes all employees of any public entity. So what happens to athletes at public universities? Well, it depends on what state they're in. For example, if you're back in New York or Michigan or Ohio or uh, some of the other states back east or California, um, you may have a statute that applies uh, equally or as well as or differently than the National Labor Relations Act that, per that allows those employees to do it, claim it. There's no decision that says that they are employees but that doesn't mean somebody's not going to try for it now. So you could have 50 different definitions of an employee, of a student athlete employee. Somebody said that to me today earlier, and I told them, yeah, but not in Arizona, so don't so worry. So 49 about it. then, yeah. yeah right. Um, the only school in Arizona that's covered by this would be Grand Canyon. True, that's true. Because U of A and ASU are both public schools. And Grand Canyon just started their sports program. Right. So uh, welcome to the, to the sporting welcome world. Welcome to the sporting uh, world. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know the NCAA and the schools are saying that the, the athletes, they're students, they're not, they're not the same as truckers. They're not the same as workers in the traditional sense of employees. Does that go, is that gonna stand? Is a trucker the same as a university professor? Well, that's maybe a bad example. Is a trucker the same as a, as a auto worker who builds a car? Is a trucker the same as a pilot of an airplane? The statutes cover different types of employees and these are different type of employee. Baseball players, football players, and the professional leagues are all covered by this statute. Well, considering this, the, the, the unique nature of a student athlete, are, is there case law out there? Is there anything similar to this? No. Where, nothing? No. The, the university argued that the Brown, there was a case involving Brown University involving stu graduate student teachers. And they were held to not be employees because they were there for a very short period of time, a year or two generally. and that they were, their primary purpose was education of themselves, th to get their education, and this was a way they were paying for it. The this regional director here distinguished that case by saying, well, that's go all good, well and good, but they're not working 40 to 60 hours a week, and their goal here is not to teach other students or to learn, it's to play football and win a game, as, as the uh, Northwestern said mm -hmm. in a video that was in evidence, the goal is to win games. They make a lot of money off football. So we, ha we have this guy in Chicago with this ruling now. Does it go back to D.C. in the full board? If the university appeals. And I'm they, sure they and will. They, they said that already that they will. They have 30 days. They have a right to request review. They will get a very quick preliminary decision from the labor board uh, if it's a yes. If it's a no, it'll take time. But Generally, the board issues a quick decision. They hold, they hold an election, lock the ballots up without counting them, and wait for a full decision to come down. My guess is that we'll know the answer to that within three months. If the, if the, the full board says, these are employees, you better get used to it, how does college sports get used to it? I don't think that that's a big deal. Interesting. They just have to sit down and bargain with them over terms and conditions of employment. They may have to bargain over wages. It's, that would be an interesting one because of the NCAA rules. You're going to have strikes? You're going to have university locking out some of these student athletes? I don't know that that's ever going to happen, but who knows? It's possible. It's possible. It's possible now. Yeah. I mean, what's to stop the athletes from saying we're not going to play this weekend? 
In fact, that happened last season, or earlier this season, I think one of the colleges in the South, if I remember right, uh, the players refused to, to travel to a game because they were mistreated by the coach. D ex exactly, and the coach, I believe, got the boot out of I that I think one. so. I'm not yeah. sure about I, all I the facts on that. Yeah. yeah. So, so last question. You a college sports fan? Big one. All right. Do you think that in three to five years, or, or in the foreseeable future, we will look back on this and look back on college sports as it now exists and say, wow, things have certainly changed? They're going to change anyway. The NCAA is under incredible pressure to pass rules to allow these, uh, these athletes to be paid something or do something different. They're under incredible pressure to change the rules now, irrespective of this decision. So uh, will there be change? Yes. Will this decision drive the change? Probably in part, yes. But in part, it depends on whether it stands. Yes. I mean, you know, and, and I think it, it's going to be a question of a lot of other factors coming in as well. And very quickly, if the universities decide a stipend is the way to go, a certain X is, is every athlete gets paid X, does that alleviate some concerns here or is that just a whole different avenue? It might. It might? It might. But the concern here that has been driving this train has been injuries. What happens if I get hurt? Yes. What happens for the rest of my life? And there are other thing. lawsuits out right now along those lines. True. In fact, the, you know, the coaches at Northwestern are not, are not opposed to this. This is a fascinating. It's it good is. to have you here. Thanks for oh, joining. My pleasure. My pleasure. And that is it for now. Thank you so much for joining us on this special Labor Day edition of Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.